In a discourse delivered during summer 1839, Joseph Smith spoke about Revelation, declaring that it was the privilege of all Latter-day Saints to receive a personal visit from the Father and the Son, and to have, quote, the visions of the heavens opened unto them. These promises are no doubt striking, but what's truly noteworthy about this discourse is the way Joseph closed the sermon, teaching that these grand visions were ultimately contingent on one's ability to, quote, notice the first intimations of the spirit of revelation. What makes Joseph Smith fascinating as a prophet is that he seemed to favor subtle religious experiences over dramatic encounters with the divine, a point that is crucial for, un for appreciating the nature of his prophetic voice and for helping today's Latter-day Saints find relevance from the Joseph Smith papers. Intended primarily for scholars, the Joseph Smith Papers is an imposing collection of nearly 30 volumes detailing the milestones and minutiae of Joseph Smith's life. These primary sources cover abstruse legal matters, recount various financial transactions, record Joseph's correspondence, and contain his revelations and teachings. Now, the benefit of these papers for scholars is clear because scholars work with primary sources, but how will this collection help members who approach Joseph Smith's teachings through a devotional lens. My response is that the project opens the possibility for uncovering new implications of Joseph's revelations and teachings. For the first time, all of Joseph Smith's surviving papers are gathered, meaning that the foundational doctrines of the Restoration can now be placed in conversation with all aspects of Joseph's life. This is important because Joseph was inseparable from his immediate environment. Indeed, there is no Joseph the prophet apart from Joseph the debtor, or Joseph the husband, or Joseph the defendant, or Joseph the city planner. Appreciating the historical backdrop of his revelations can help explain their logic and yield insights into how his teachings can be applied today. In this paper, I want to illustrate how theological possibilities can arise when we situate Joseph Smith within his historical context, and I will focus my remarks on Joseph's experience with Revelation. Too often, when we think about Joseph's encounter with heaven, we focus on his dramatic visions and manifestations. While essential to his ministry, these experiences do not offer a complete picture of what it meant for Joseph Smith to receive a revelation. More foundational to Joseph's encounter with God was his commonplace encounter with the Holy Spirit. Indeed, what the Joseph Smith papers reveal is that the restoration was propelled more by the mundane than the spectacular. And appreciating this fact, I believe, has implications for Latter-day Saints today who are seeking revelation. Joseph Smith's historical context and revelations are big topics, so I'm gonna focus my remarks by interpreting Joseph's experience with unfulfilled revelation against the backdrop of one of the major historical themes of the papers, namely his attempt to build Zion. One of my biggest takeaways from working on the Joseph Smith papers is that the prophet was preoccupied with Zion in a way I had not considered before. During the 1830s, Joseph prioritized the revelations to establish the new Jerusalem in Missouri. After the saints were expelled from the state in the winter of 1838 and 39, Joseph then spent the rest of his life trying to get justice for the saints' suffering and losses. The Zion Project was a product of revelation. The Book of Mormon and the Book of Moses both anticipated a holy city to be established in the latter days, and in the early revelations, God provided specific direction for how the saints were to establish this city of refuge. But the plan to build the New Jerusalem as originally conceived went unfulfilled. The main question, that, therefore, that I'm going to ask today is what can the Joseph Smith Papers teach Latter-day Saints about processing the experience of unfulfilled revelation? And I will argue that God's response to this experience as recorded in the papers can provide a reference point for contemporary Latter-day Saints working through the disillusionment that can sometimes accompany spiritual disappointment. I'll proceed in two parts. First, I'm going to unpack what Revelation meant for Joseph. And second, I'll explore what relevant message there is from the failure to build the New Jerusalem. And because of my paper smacks of theodicy, um, I feel the need to define what Joseph Smith meant by God. After, after all, a theodicy attempts to explain how a conception of God and the experience of suffering can coexist. For Joseph, God was an exalted person who overcame the limitations of mortality, 
understands the human condition thoroughly and participates in history to help deliver his children from all forms of oppression. For Joseph Smith, revelation was a process of receiving knowledge from God primarily through the Holy Spirit. To the saints in spring 1839, he wrote, God shall give unto you knowledge by his Holy Spirit, yea, by the unspeakable gift of the Holy Ghost. Receiving revelation, however, is challenging and requires attention and sensitivity. In the summer, in the summer 1839 discourse that I opened with, Joseph taught that, quote, a person may profit by noticing the first intimations of the spirit of revelation. Intimations, a word defined as hints or suggestions, indicates that revelation arrives piecemeal, or to use Joseph's phrasing, through sudden strokes of ideas. Revelation, Joseph said in the same discourse, was also fluid. Joseph described the experience of having ideas presented to the mind as, quote, the feeling of pure intelligence flowing. For Joseph, recognizing the spirit of revelation was also a process of learning to speak God's language. Phrases such as sudden strokes of ideas and first intimations suggest that subtlety was God's preferred method of communication. Human language, on the other hand, Joseph famously complained, was a prison. It was fractured and ugly, or to use his words, crooked, broken, scattered, and imperfect. Revelation then was a foreign concept to human minds. Joseph taught, therefore, that one needs to, quote, learn the spirit of God and understand it so that one may, quote, grow into the principle of revelation. A few months before, in spring 1839, Joseph enjoined the saints to uncover the things of God through, quote, careful and ponderous and solemn thoughts. Careful thinking was required to receive revelation, but it was also necessary after the revelation was received. Recall Oliver Cowdery, who was instructed to reflect on a prior revelation when he needed additional assurance about working with Joseph. God told Oliver, quote, if you desire a further witness, cast your mind upon the night when you cried unto me. Did I not speak peace to your mind? Joseph was one who followed his own advice and reflected on his own revelations throughout his life. One of my favorite parts of Joseph's final sermon in June 1844 was his explanation that an insight into the nature of God came to him as he worked on the translation of the book of Abraham. This process of careful thinking and noticing the first intimations of the spirit was the channel through which Joseph received some of his most profound revelation. At the April 1844 conference where he unpacked his doctrine of deity, Joseph said that these teachings about God, quote, were given me by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. During his final discourse where he explained more about his beliefs concerning God, he noted the source of his teachings again, quote, I have it from God, so get over it. I have a witness of the Holy Ghost. In other words, the most profound doctrines of the Restoration, those dealing with the natures of God and Christ and humans, came to Joseph the same way that Latter-day Saints receive revelation, that is, by thinking and praying and reflecting and paying attention to the spirit of revelation. Revelation, though, wasn't an experience only for the mind, but was meant to affect change in the world. In the summer 1839 discourse, Joseph explained that if one paid attention to the sudden strokes of ideas that came through the spirit of revelation, that those things would be, quote, fulfilled the same day or soon. However, some of Joseph's teachings received through the spirit of revelation, namely the call to build Zion in Missouri, never received fulfillment. Building the New Jerusalem in Missouri was a cornerstone of Joseph's prophetic mission. The restoration, the early revelation suggests, was to culminate in this city, for the elect would gather there to weather the apocalyptic storm preceding the second coming. A July 1831 revelation with God as voice identified Independence, Missouri as the center place for this anticipated city. Quote, I have appointed and consecrated this land for the gathering of the saints. And when opposition against Joseph Zion began to materialize, God responded by shoring up his promises. In the aftermath of the expulsion from Jackson County in 1833, God declared, quote, Zion shall not be moved out of her place. Yet, during the winter of 1838 and 39, it was. And the revelations about Zion in Missouri remain to this day unfulfilled. Now, one can look at this situation and say there really isn't an issue here right after all the church continued. But there's more at stake here than making sense of Joseph's failure as a city planner. 
Unfulfilled revelation is not a historical puzzle, but an existential issue. And the response to this challenge has implications for how Latter-day Saints today, for any Latter-day Saint today, who wrestles with the experience of spiritual disillusionment. For example, how do church members retain confidence in God when priesthood blessings aren't as efficacious as expected, or when obedience to promptings from the Holy Ghost seem to lead to cursings rather than blessings, or when promises and patriarchal blessings appear to grow stale? The Joseph Smith Papers demonstrates that unfulfilled revelation and its sometimes accompanying disappointment are experiences that God takes seriously and responds to personally. Three of those responses, which I will briefly, which I will briefly examine, are as follows. First, God responds to these experiences with compassion. Second, God responds by respecting the limitations of people's circumstances. And three, God responds by finding ways to bring those who have suffered such disappointment into deeper communion with him. So first, God responds to these experiences with compassion. Some were disenchanted with the Zion Project from the very beginning. When Joseph Smith and a group of elders traveled to Independence, Missouri in summer 1831, they found a desolate town with a handful of members. The reality of the situation did not inspire confidence. Early attempts by missionaries to gain converts there fell flat. During the trip, Edward Partridge and Joseph Smith were bickering over land, and Ezra Booth, one of the elders who traveled to Missouri, grew disillusioned with Joseph's leadership. When Joseph returned to Kirtland, he received a revelation containing God's response to their trip. God warned Booth and Partridge to repent and reprimanded Joseph for his sins and called for members of the group to forgive one another. The chastisement, however, was not how the revelation commenced. Before God corrected, he commiserated, opening the revelation by saying, quote, I will have compassion upon you, and I will be merciful unto you. Conscious that the reality of independence didn't live up to the ex expectations of the elders, God expressed compassion and showed a willingness to suffer with the elders in their disillusionment. God did not condone their behavior, but did not condemn their frustrations. The second response in the papers is that God respects the limitations of people's circumstances. The Joseph Smith Papers demonstrates that unfulfilled revelation happens at times because of human limitation. God's acknowledgement of those limitations means that God takes the human situation seriously. In January 1841, roughly two years after the saints had been expelled from Missouri, Joseph and Nauvoo received a revelation about the failure of Zion. With God's voice, the revelation states, I say unto you that when I give a commandment unto any of the sons of men to do a work unto my name, and those sons of men go with all their might and, and with all they have to perform that work and cease not their diligence, and their enemies come upon them and hinder them for, from performing that work, behold, it behooveth me, that's a word just means uh, that it's necessary for me, it behooveth me to require that work no more. In short, God acknowledges that the saints found themselves in an impossible situation where they could not live out the mandates of the revelation. Turning Independence, Missouri into the New Jerusalem, building a temple there, establishing gathering places, all parts of the, of the revelations about Zion were, in January 1844, no longer required. God acknowledged the efforts of the saints and shifted theological gears, declaring in the 1841 revelation that Nauvoo was to be the new foundation, calling, it the, calling the city the cornerstone of Zion. This revelatory shift shouldn't be too surprising. After all, God declared 10 years earlier in a revelation that he can change course if he desires, quote, I the Lord command and revoke as it seemeth me good. But if this is the case, how can we have confidence in God if God can, can change his mind? The Joseph Smith Papers indicates that God's decision to revoke his early command is not motivated by caprice, but is an expression of how seriously God takes the human condition. He acknowledges the limitations of people and does not ask them to accomplish something beyond their capability. God recognized that the situation for the saints in Missouri had changed. The fall of 1838 was not the same as the summer of 1831. What he once asked of them became impossible to achieve due to forces outside of their control. God therefore revoked the command and decided to find a new avenue to gather his people. Acknowledging human, 
limitations also suggests that the God introduced through Joseph Smith's revelations is someone who works to dignify the lives of average people. Remember, my paper today is predicated on, on the definition that God is an exalted human who thoroughly understands what humans are and are not capable of. God in Latter-day Saint scripture is depicted as one who condescends, who recognizes the limitations of the human experience and because of those limitations wants to help us Indeed, the very plan of salvation for Joseph Smith began with God condescending to assist those who were weaker than he was. At the Lyceum meetings in Nauvoo of early 1841, Joseph explained that the plan of salvation began with a moment of divine anxiety when God observed a group of spirits, us, who were in peril and condescended to warn them of their danger and offer them assistance. One example of God's work to dignify people despite their failures and limitations appears in God's counsel to Oliver Granger in 1838. Granger's work in settling Joseph Smith's business affairs in Kirtland merited the promise that, quote, his name shall be had in sacred remembrance from generation to generation forever. The counsel to Granger also instructed him that, quote, when he falls, he shall rise again. Years ago, one general authority in conference noted how this revelation says when and not if, almost as if God were expecting Granger to stumble. Oliver Granger was an average Latter-day Saint and had been partially blind for over a decade. Despite his limitations and the possibility that he would fail at his assignment, God stated that this man's life was sacred. A declaration comparable to the account in Mark's gospel of Jesus blessing the unnamed woman for anointing him before his death, saying, quote, she hath done what she could. God is depicted in Joseph Smith's papers as a being who finds the value in the ordinary and the mundane and works to dignify and sanctify the Oliver Grangers of the world, those who stumble because of their limitations. The final response from God to the issue with unfulfilled revelation is that God is capable of causing failure to yield moments of deeper communion. Paradoxically, the most pronounced failures of the early church indirectly led to some of the most profound encounters with God. For, in for instance, the failure of Joseph and his camp of Israel to redeem Zion in 1834 led to a renewed focus on completing the house of the Lord, where the elders received the endowment of power and where Christ appeared to accept the work of all the ordinary Latter-day Saints who built the temple. The 1838-39 expulsion from Missouri led the saints to Illinois, where they had enough social stability for Joseph to introduce the ordinances of the temple, thereby allowing Latter-day Saint men and women an opportunity to receive the keys of knowledge. Now, this is not to say that these spiritual moments depended on failure, nor is it to say that the failure was planned, but it is to say that God's higher goal of communing with his people was not frustrated because of setbacks and disappointments. I want to conclude by asking what all of this says about the nature of Revelation. What the Joseph Smith papers have taught me is that Revelation, in part, is less about the future and more about what is expedient in the moment. Recall from the summer 1839 discourse that Joseph spoke of fulfillment happening, quote, the same day or soon. The revelatory experience Joseph spoke of was concerned with the present. Oliver Cowdery's attempt to translate the gold plates in 1829 illustrates this point. Due to his fear and misunderstanding of the mechanics about revelation, Oliver failed to translate when given the chance. God responded, quote, Oliver, if you had known this, that is, if he had known how revelation worked, you could have translated. Nevertheless, it is not expedient that you should translate now. The council continued, it was expedient when you commenced, but you feared, and the time is past, and it is not expedient. God rounded out this, his instruction to Oliver with these words, do you not behold that I have given unto my servant Joseph sufficient strength whereby it is made up, and neither of you have I condemned. Acknowledging the reality of unfulfilled revelation affects our conception of God. It's part of the human experience and it's part of participating in religion. Um, but when we take it seriously, it casts God as a being who works within history. And to work within history means that God must respect the flow of time and be able to respond to situations and conditions that are in constant flux. It is therefore for this reason that pure intelligence must flow and humans learn to become sensitive to the sudden strokes of ideas and intimations of the spirit that of necessity respond to the vicissitudes of history. Thank you.